This is Duke University. If you think about uh, the period when environmental issues emerged onto the international stage, start at the very end of the 1960s, early 1970s. Uh, at that time, the U.S. was clearly uh, the leader on international environmental politics and uh, being very supportive of a series of multilateral environmental agreements passed at the time. Uh, it was uh, one of the lead organizers of the 1972 uh, UN uh, summit in Stockholm on the human environment and then uh, helped sponsor and led the way on a number of international treaties throughout the 1970s. And this uh, kind of leadership role even persisted uh, into the 1980s, even under the Reagan administration, which we'll talk about later. Um, meanwhile, uh, at, at, during this period, the member states of what was then the EEC, so the West European countries and the European Economic Community, uh, they did follow along uh, in the sense that they eventually ratified multilateral treaties uh, that were proposed in this period, some more supportive than others. But uh, many of the states were quite reluctant followers of the U.S. lead. Uh, and this, uh, as I said, this kind of persists into the 80s. But by the early 1990s, we have this dramatic reversal, okay, where the U.S. becomes essentially the global environmental laggard, uh, unwilling to uh, support multilateral environmental agreements. Uh, and meanwhile, the EU assumes this leadership role in quite dramatic fashion, becoming the champion of nearly all the multilateral environmental agreements after the early 1990s. So our big questions, why did the EU replace the U.S. as international environmental leader? Why has the U.S. become such a laggard? That's it's a pretty straightforward question. We can talk about generalizability to other things, but our main interest is really in this one overarching question. And now the outline for the rest of the talk, what I'm going to go through today, uh, I'm going to talk about some of the existing literature on state support for multilateral environmental agreements and explain why those uh, arguments that are out there can't uh, answer our question today about this trading places. Uh, then I'll go over what our, our argument is, this kind of regulatory politics approach uh, that weds domestic politics and international regulatory competition to explain these patterns. Um, oh, sorry, oops, wrong button. Uh, then I'll uh, talk about uh, uh, the, a bit of the empirics on what was the domestic political situation and the regulatory competition pressures in the U.S. and in the EU and kind of go over this in a few case studies uh, very quickly so we don't want to have a lot of time. But we'll talk about ozone depletion, trade in GMOs, climate change, and uh, this recent treaty on persistent organic pollutants. And essentially, you know, to make a long story short, we've had essentially no significant environmental legislation in the U.S. since then, you know, period. There's a couple laws we mentioned in the paper, but in terms of significant domestic measures, right, it's just, there's been nothing, right? And I mean, this was personified even by, you know, Clinton, he proposed a couple environmental measures early on. They were shot down in Congress, even by the Democratic Congress, okay? The, the BTU tax, for instance, which is going to be a tax on energy that Gore had proposed. This is all shot down. And then once the um, uh, Republicans take over Congress in 1994, then it's just, it's over for domestic environmental legislation. Okay? Um, and well, I'm not even going to talk about the Bush administration, but you know, obviously they, the new Bush administration uh, didn't want to do anything uh, on the environment. Now in the EU, uh, the timing goes just, I mean, it's quite striking. Basically, the, the US and the EU uh, pass each other, as it were, uh, just at the same moment, going in opposite directions. Germany, Denmark, Netherlands, those green states, then they push the others along in ways we describe in more detail in the paper to uh, adopt high level standards for the EU as a whole. So the e and, and then the EU institutions like the European Parliament and the European Commission they saw that they could gain legitimacy with voters if the EU was really doing something strong on the environment because it was a popular issue. And so the, the kind of coalition of green member states with these European institutions, 
uh, pushed along the EU environmental agenda. So the EU was really ramping up the strictness of standards and trying to take uh, um, an ambitious role in proposing new regulations. Okay? And along with that, as we'll see in these case studies, the EU also began to take on this global leadership role where at the same time that it was proposing very ambitious standards, which became the strictest in the world, surpassing the US standards in the 90s, the EU was also then saying, well, we need to spread these standards internationally by championing multilateral environmental agreements. OK, now, now I'll, I'll get to some of these case studies, which will flesh out these dynamics. But just you know, a quote first to capture, you know, the logic's pretty simple of this regulatory competition. Uh, this is from Russell Train, who was the head of Nixon's Council on uh, Environmental Quality. Uh, but the same could be said for the US. You know, it's in the US competitive interest to have other nations raise environmental standards and thus their production costs and strengthen their enforcement of those standards. So I mean, this is the logic that I'm really, you know, we're really arguing for. Uh, and um, you know, if you just think about the domestic politics uh, timeline that I gave you, you can understand this switch because when we go to the cases, you'll see you know, essentially the 70s and the 80s, the US was facing domestic pressure for regulation uh, and therefore was supporting treaties that would internationalize or spread around the world the kind of standards it was being pressed to do domestically. By the 1990s, you know, the US wasn't under that pressure, but the EU was, and EU member states were. And uh, they then uh, start aggressively supporting international treaties to spread those standards. This explanation that links domestic politics to the dynamics of international regulatory competition explains this broad shift. And you know, I just want to emphasize in closing, this, you know, this wasn't a study, it's not a large end study in the sense, you know, we, we do talk about a lot of treaties, we look at a lot of treaties, uh, but in essence, what we're really talking about is a broad shift in leadership. That's what we're really interested in. And although you can look at each case individually as we do, I think you, you can't separate them entirely. That the, there is this broad shift in positions on international environmental politics that's rooted in shifts in domestic politics and the uh, economic interests, uh, the changes in economic interests that come along with that. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.